Welcome to Pop Turnative, where we dive into topical discussions from the worlds of pop culture, social media, and sports. Here is your host, Peter Ramoliotis, aka PD Beats. Hello and welcome to the Pop Turnative Podcast. This is the podcast where we have digital discussions from the worlds of pop culture, sports, and social media. And it is an honor and a privilege to be speaking to to be uh, with my guest uh, this evening. I'm really, really excited to uh, have him on. I am with director known for his television and his film work. Currently, he's uh, known and promoting his work on the sci-fi hit show The Expanse. And he's also the director of many films such as D3, The Mighty Ducks, All I Want for Christmas. I am with director Robert Lieberman. Robert, welcome to Pop Tardive. It's a delight to be here with you, Peter. I'm uh, very excited to have this conversation. I'm excited too. First off, right off the bat, congratulations on the success thus far uh, with The Expanse. It's such a fantastic show. The imagery is amazing. It's so stunning. It's like eye candy everywhere. So just congrats on that. Well, thank you very much. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm very proud of the look of the show and, uh, uh, and the veracity of the science behind the show. Uh, but I'm most proud of the uh, the story that that emanated from the novels uh, from Ty Frank and Daniel and they their uh, essay Corey is what they go under and um, and for me filmmaking always relies upon uh, relationships and the interesting part of the expanse is that although it takes place in the future and and it's fantastic and has all these fantastic images. It really comes down to really human nature and relationships, which are is the hallmark of all my work. No, absolutely, and I've I, I've seen uh, you interview talking about your work in the Expanse. And what I really love about it, Rob, is how excited you are to talk about it. I mean, it's like you've been you've been doing this for quite some time in television and film, um, and it just seems like a project you're really proud of, and you're just like. like really excited for it it's almost like if you talk about it you know you've been doing this for many years and it's almost like uh, talking about the expanse with you in these interview clips it's like it's your first big it's your first project that you're so pumped about it well i i approach everything like it is my first project oh, that's i really have no i don't i don't fall back on laurels everything is the most important thing that i've ever done and uh in the case of the expanse you know if you look at the whole landscape of filmmaking um, I think uh, some of the most important filmmaking now is made is done on television. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, feature films they they you know they go the extra mile with hundreds of millions of dollars worth of CGI and so forth. But eventually, you tire of explosions. For me, there's just you know I, you see enough explosions, you've seen explosions. But what made this series so great is that it had the the uh, the the, the uh, production value of those feature films on television but told a real story, almost a noir story, almost a throwback to the 40s, it starts out. Um, and uh, I, I just thought it was the most unique. Uh, I, when I went on that show originally, Peter, I, um, uh, I had read the books. I came in midway through the first season, and uh, I, I, I went into the executive producers and uh, the show was run by a brilliant, brilliant writer, uh, pr- producer by the name of Narain Shankar. And um, and I said to him and Mark Fergus, who his partner, Hawk Osby, the two of those guys had written the first draft of uh, Children of Men and the original Iron Man. So these are superstars. Oh, and I and, and I, I closed the door and I said, listen, I. Yeah, let, let me just tell you, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a director, so I have a big mouth, and I say what I think, and uh, but I also have thick skin, and you can discard anything you don't like. But I feel compelled, you're paying me a lot of money, that I should tell you what I think. And I, they said, okay, shoot. And I said, well, I have to admit to you, I've looked at the first four or five episodes, and it's not the, ep- it's not the series that I would have envisioned. It's just not the series I that I I thought the show would look much more like Blade Runner or the original uh, Ridley Scott's Alien, yeah. and it looked it looked closer to like Star Trek at the beginning, and and I just I thought it was too clean. It was too the interiors of spacecrafts were too vast. It, the only visceral uh, relationship we have to space 
is the space station and capsules and the moon lander and you know and 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 if you look at those spaces they're very tightly every square inch is used up things are embedded in the walls and the, the, the passageways are tiny and here the expanse started out with rooms the size of banquet halls yeah. and it was like just to fill that with oxygen is it would be impossible so i expressed that thinking that they were going to throw me out of the office and instead they embraced it they said we agree with you and they endorsed my vision of it and uh, if you go back and look at season one when i came in at uh, episode five and six uh, the show takes a kind of a different look. Um, I, I, I really came in. I said, I want this. I would like to see the show much grungier. Um, I referenced Brazil. I said, I want to see a lot of ducting and wires and crap hanging off the walls. And uh, and uh, to my surprise, they embraced every inch of that. And uh, and the show actually that was my contribution to my main contribution to uh uh, the expanse. Man, I love your passion. You're so passionate when you talk about this. It's awesome. Well, you know what? It was my dream as a kid to do this, and the fact that I got to do it all my life, mm -hmm. and uh, and I'm still doing it, is uh, I still have that same passion. I have the same exact energy and passion I had when I walked on a set for the very first time and realized I was doing something. I'm from Buffalo, New York, which is yep. 90 miles south of uh, Toronto. And I was grew up a poor kid, and I, the furthest from my concept of what I could possibly be in my life would be a Hollywood film director. I, when I went out to California when I was 21, I had never ever met anybody who had ever been to California. So this was a total dream for me. And I feel it's a, I, I honor that dream. And, and the, my legacy, which is really exciting, and I get super excited about is I have two sons that are both now going to become directors and one graduated from Columbia cum laude who's absolutely a brilliant guy and my youngest son is in his senior year at Northwestern and he's a brilliant guy wow and passing and, the uh, torch exactly I it's exactly the basically what I said to them I said you know what I was grew up a poor kid in Buffalo I carried the water from Buffalo to Hollywood and I thought I, my dream was to win the Academy Award. I'm not going to do that. But you're going to have to carry the water the rest of the way. And I said, although I wanted to win the Academy Award, nothing, and I mean it from the bottom of my heart, I said to my sons, would make me happier in my life than to be in the audience when you win yours. Wow. No, that, that's amazing. Now, you mentioned something you wanted to do as a kid. Now, speaking of that, I think this is a good segue into the next conversation I've been dying to have with you, and I'm pretty sure you know what that's going to be about. But, Rob, nostalgia is a powerful thing. I, I grew up a huge hockey fan. I grew up a kid in the 90s. Mighty Ducks, those movies, were are still a very important part of my life. And you directed D3. You directed the third, the third installment. Yeah, and, and um, <laughs> uh, the, the experience of doing that, first of all, is I'm, a, I'm also a hockey freak. Mm -hmm. And I grew up in Buffalo, a hockey freak. Yep. And I, the Maple Leafs were very important to me. The Canadians were very important to me. The Habs, the Sabres were very important to me. I, I still think to this day, uh, although I'm interested in all sports, I think hockey is the greatest sport that was ever invented. Mm -hmm. It's the most exciting. It's the most continuous. It's the most vibrant sport. And I, and I can't get enough of it. Cannot get enough of it. At any rate, uh, I did not have any hockey movies that I, uh, Slapshot was probably the closest thing to a hockey movie that I, and maybe uh, uh, the, uh, the, the film about the Miracle Team mm -hmm. uh, were the only films that I actually uh, uh, knew of the hockey game. But I had done some football films. Mm -hmm. And um, and one of the hallmarks of any sports film that I do is I make the sports make sense. I, I don't just throw a puck on the ice and let a bunch of people skate around it and pretend like they're playing. Yeah. We lay out each play. We laid out all the plays of that. And that was one of the distinguishing things between, and I think all three Mighty Ducks were wonderful. But one of the real distinguishing things in my Mighty Ducks is if you go back, the hockey makes sense. You can follow the puck. You know where the puck is. You know what the play is. You know where the pass goes. You know what the setup is. You know how they score. 
And it's, it's, I, I, it took a long time, it's a hard work to sit with a, a, a master coach uh, and lay out all these plays because you got, for Phil, you got to lay out those plays and you have to run them over and over and over again from a bunch of different angles. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, no, no matter what, or, what, what, what sport I direct, I make sure that the sport makes perfect sense. You can follow the sport. I mean, they're winning. The, I, I understand what you're saying, but, you know, they're winning 9 nothing in that game and just collapsed. And, <laughs> and, and, so, and that, that, that's something I wanted to ask you. I mean, like, how did that part come to be? Like, how did who who wanted to do like nine nothing and then nine nine tie? Like, why couldn't it have been like five nothing and then they lose six five? I'm just like, I always wanted to know this. So that yeah. well, it's I mean, it has to do with sustaining suspense, obviously, <laughs> and and the tropes of of a sports movie are exaggerated in a kids sports movie. Absolutely. Uh, so, Right, so, but those bears were like they were doing nothing the whole game. Boom, nine goals. It's just like, <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> yeah, the, you, you know, when you, when you least expect it, you know, you gotta, you got in, in a good motion picture, you gotta, you gotta mix them up and you gotta surprise the audience. Uh, and I felt for this film was for kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was no question in my mind that I was making a film for young people who loved the sport. And, uh, and and I wanted them to have the experience of, you know, it's got the tropes of the, the you know, the, the original uh, film, which uh, 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 Stephen, um, uh, I'm blocking his name. Uh, Stephen uh, Herrick? Yeah, Steve Herrick directed. Yeah, Steve Herrick. Steve yeah. Herrick's a terrific director. Yeah. And he's, he kind of set the template. Did he do the, the second one? No, he did not do the second okay. one. Uh, the second one was, I can't think of his name either, but it was a different director. Sam... Sam something. You'll Did you up. have to watch the, the first two a lot to make the, oh, sure. the third? Oh, sure. Yeah. Oh, sure. But but you have to understand, when you watch the first two a lot, you're watching it primarily to see what you could do to improve them. Yeah. Because you, you, you don't want to just replicate them. You want to do better than them. There's so, so. many There's so many different things in that movie that I, I just thought of right now. Like, for example, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the things, too, is... Uh, the whole transformation of Charlie Conway. We see Charlie kind of in the first is like kind of like this nice humble kid, you know, getting picked on. Then the second, you see him still as this nice kid and not like the top scorer ends up, you know, giving Adam Banks his place, you know. There's a transformation. He just he becomes like a jerk in the beginning of the movie. And it's like, what happened to like the sweet little Charlie? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, well, he's going through that that time of his life where he was... <laughs> I'm very down. into this movie. This is a, this is important for me to know these things. <laughs> yeah, no, he was hormonally challenged, and uh, and uh, it, it was important to for me to create a, 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 a dynamic character out of Charlie, so that he wasn't just the nice little kid. That the, that he's got enough conflict in his life to create a drama here. You know, I mean, we had a look. The first one we understand that was a Sandlot ball team basically or copy yeah. team that was scraped together by Emilio yeah. and the second one was an international sports event mm -hmm. and the third one is they finally make it to this private school and they have to play the upperclassmen and they're they're the these little nerds possibly um captained by coach O'Reilly's grandson or son because we see Riley on the back of his jersey right is that that's that's not intentional right like, is that an easter no. egg you guys put in no it wasn't intentional that's all right just, what was intentional is that <laughs> i called i called the school eden hall so that the letters on their jacket would go eh <laughs> <laughs> oh <laughs> Yeah, oh, so that's there, great! There's, there's, there's there's a lot of little nuggets in that film that I kind of kind of slammed in there. Um, you know, when they're at the Ball of America's playing, you know that um, the editor came up with um, what's the name of that group that uh, uh, I'm in? Uh, oh, they're they're at the time they were unheard of, and now and then they became very big. The music group, and it's uh, this is me and. 10th grade, I think is the name, or this is me in ninth grade. Yes. Is, is, is the name of the song. And uh, they're a Canadian group. 
And, is, that bare, uh, is that bare naked ladies? Yeah, bare naked ladies. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Okay, when they're in the classroom, the classroom montage, and when they're going to, when Fulton and Charlie go to the the roller coaster in the mall. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Okay, so th this is me in ninth grade. And anyways, he brings me the song from this new group that nobody knew about. And then who knew they were going to explode into to bare naked ladies? That's awesome. But, but I love that sequence because of that song. And so, I did Fulton Reed, he has a Husker Du shirt on too. And that's like a that that's like a very out there alternative like For metal sure. rock sure. band. No, there's a lot of things. You know what's cool too is um, how does it feel? You know, um, many years later, you know, um, like uh, the cat. Well, his first name is Black Army, who played Fulton. Um, oh yeah, yeah. I can't name it either, but yeah. Um, well, he's in Daredevil now. And the player, the person that played Cole, is was in like Walking Dead, I believe. Well, how about uh, Keenan? Uh, uh, yeah, Keenan Thompson. Thompson. It's just like all these. He's on Saturday Night Live. He is now, Saturday Night Live. Now, was there anyone though where you're like, this guy's gonna be big, Rob? That where you made that? Was there anyone that you were like, this actor is gonna be big? Did that well, did Josh that... Jackson felt like he was gonna go the distance, and he has. For it, yeah. And, for, I mean, and, Fringe, and, Dawson's and Creek. Thompson definitely felt like he was gonna go the distance, and he has. Well, uh, he, he Keenan Thompson was doing some Nickelodeon stuff while he yeah. was on Mighty Ducks, so he was kind of known for the billing as well. Yeah, but when he hit uh, Saturday Night Live, he became a superstar. Oh, absolutely! And he he, he is really. A I don't guy. know. I grew up like I said. Me and my sister grew up watching all that, and Keenan and Kel, and he was on that, so we knew who he was because of that as well. Right, um, right. But yeah, no. And, but you you directed so many cool shows and so many cool movies and i gotta i gotta give a shout out to my mom and my sister because um you know they're what they're fit you directed like one of their favorite christmas movies of all time you directed all i want for christmas thank you thank snow, you yeah. snow snowball snowball i invented snowball you invented snowball, snowball was not in the script <laughs> i created and, snowball which is for those of your listeners that don't know who snowball was he's a little mouse a little white mouse that they use to as a ruse to get their mother and father back together. Yes, Thora Birch too, who is in uh, one of my favorite movies of all time, American Beauty, which yeah. is um, unbelievable. Movie. It's an unbelievable yeah. movie, and it's just like you—you you have been been able to work on a diverse amount of projects. What is your favorite part about directing? I know it's a very loaded question, but is there something specific about it that you just, you're driven to that you love to do, Rob? Yeah. I, I, it's not that, that's not that loaded a question. I, I, I there, there's a very specific answer for me. Okay. Um, the, on a couple levels, one of, one of the, the most important, exciting part about directing is uh, creating relationships and creating a reality that didn't exist. You know, yeah. um, as I explained to my sons who want to be a director, you know, you got to convince the audience that the life that they're watching in this movie lived before this movie starts and will continue after this movie is over with. And that's not easy because everything, all the elements that go to make a movie fight that instinct, that fight that instinct, because our lives just unfold. There's nobody there to put makeup on us, to set up the table, to set up the set, to set up the camera, to set up. Life's just unfold. And what you really want to do is create something that looks to the audience like it's just life unfolded. Yep. But everything around you is around, you're surrounded by people that want to make the hair look perfect. They want to make the makeup look perfect. They want to make the sets look perfect. And I, that's why I tell people, it's, it's my job as a director to screw all that up. You, you want to do the best job of your life, and it's my job to make sure I screw it all up. Because otherwise, it looks too canned. It looks too antiseptic. Yeah. So one of the joys of is, is creating a reality that didn't exist and working with actors. I came out of theater originally, and I and working with actors and getting performances and, and getting into their psyche, and that's really very rewarding. And lastly, um, I find it a privilege as a filmmaker that I am one of the few people on my films that get to see it live. Everybody else gets to sit in the theater or in the living room watch it on their TV set. I got to sit there in Rome and watch the actors do the lines. So whenever, whenever, whenever I'm on a set, 
I feel like it is a supreme privilege to watch it unfold live and have control over it. I can change it. I can tell them to do it differently. I can fix it. I call, I started my career as an editor. I actually started originally as a kid actor and in theater, but then, but in film, I started as an editor. And in an, edit, in an editing suite, you use generally now an Avid. And an Avid has two screens in front of you and you uh, have your dailies that you shot a month ago, three weeks ago, yesterday yeah. on one screen and you piece it together onto the other screen. Yeah. And what I call directing is virtual editing. It's virtual editing. You sit behind two screens as well because there's two cameras out there filming it. And whereas in an editing suite, if you don't like what's on the screen that's delivering the daily, you have no control over it. It's already been committed to film. But on a set, you're, I'm editing, but I can actually scream out to the actor and say, put your hand down. And they put their hand down. Whereas in an editing suite, I can't yell that at the screen. They won't yeah. respond. No, that that's amazing. Well, I, I love your passion. It's it's Thanks. it's incredible. I mean, um, we'll wrap up. But Rob, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, this is this has been a treat. Um, I'm probably gonna go watch D three as soon as I'm done. I'm you you. Um, Enjoy it, and, and you know, if you have any 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 other questions or want any other insights into the film, feel free. I have to so many involved. questions. I mean, there's so many different questions. I mean. Gunnar Stahl returns as a goaltender in the movie. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's so many questions, but no, it's uh, it's amazing, and I wish you all congrats again on the success of uh, the Expanse. And uh, uh, is that is there anything now that, that you're working on right now? I know there's a lot of uh, NDAs. You know, you're not maybe not a lot of talk about anything. But are you working on any current projects, or is right now just kind of promoting? You know, the Expanse. Are you working on anything? Uh, yeah, no, I'm working on, first of all, I started uh, my film career as a commercial editor, then a commercial director, so I'm doing a package of Toyota commercials right now. Oh, wow. Uh, but, but more importantly, I'm doing another, I, I did a hockey film in Canada called Breakaway. Yes, with Russell Peters and right. um, the girl Rob from when a, when a Stranger Calls. Uh, Rob Be Lowe? Yeah, Camilla Bell? Camilla Bell? Uh, Camilla Bell. Camilla, Camilla Bell, Bell, yeah. And uh, uh, Vinay Vermani, and um, which is a which is kind of a take on Mighty Ducks in a way. Instead of the Mighty Ducks, they're the Speedy Sings. Yeah. Uh, but they're they're the uh, underdogs because they're Sikh and they wear turbans. Yes. And uh, and in Canada, they're kind of ostracized and they're not welcomed into the hockey community, even though they want to play hockey. Mm -hmm. But at any rate, uh, in answer to your question. Uh, it was a big success in 2011. It was the highest grossing English speaking film in Canada and, uh, and was, uh, 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 it premiered at TIFF in 2011. Oh, wow. So maybe a sequel or? And uh, that's what we're working on now. Oh, we're congrats. That, break, that, breakaway too. Yeah. That's awesome. No, that, that, that's really cool. There needs to be more hockey movies out there. Yeah, well, I agree. I agree. I, we just I had so many hockey ideas, you know, it's, uh, but I, you know, the, we, there's, they're hard to sell. <laughs> we, we we had Jonathan Cherry who plays uh, Marco Belchor uh, and uh, Goon and Goon uh, Goon Two: Last of the Enforcers, and we were talking about that too. Uh, there's not as many hockey movies out there, but yeah, you you keep making them. I'll watch them. <laughs> okay, all right, Peter. <laughs> well, Rob, thank you so much. Uh, anything else you want to say? Any and anything? No, you I plug? just want to thank you for having me on, and I wish you the very best with your podcast. Yep, uh, it's been a pleasure being with you. Perfect, Rob. Thank you so much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you uh, liked uh, what you listened to or viewed, uh, you could uh, subscribe to us on our YouTube page. You know, uh, you can find all the information in our uh, description. You can like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. Until next time, this is Rob Lieberman and Petey Beats signing off. We hope you enjoy this interview. Thank you for tuning in to Pop Turnative. Make sure to check out our past episodes of Pop Turnative on YouTube. Be sure to like Pop Turnative on Facebook and follow us on Twitter.